Hello everybody, is everyone all right? Uh, my name is Ben, if you don't know me, hello. So today I thought we'd do something a bit interesting. Um, I thought we'd take a trip down memory lane and uh, have a bit of a nostalgia trip. And uh, yes, look at some childhood books, books from my childhood. So I read a lot. Um, I don't read as much as some people do on booktube, uh, far from it, but I do read a lot. I don't know, maybe it was because I'm nearing my birthday and I'm sort of feeling nostalgic or whatever, but um, I was thinking about, well, where, where does this come from, this sort of passion for reading, you know? And uh, I was sort of thinking about books from my childhood, which were the kind of the formative books from my childhood and all the rest of it. So these are either books that I loved, like really, really loved, um, or they had a big influence on me for some reason or my generation. Um, or three, I just look back on them and I have a heavy sense of nostalgia and like, oh, nah. So yes, if you are a millennial like me, a snowflakey millennial like me, then, you know, maybe this will stir some memories. And if you're not a snowflakey millennial, then um, maybe this will, uh, it'll be interesting to see what books from your childhood you remember and what had a big influence, a formative influence on you. Okay, so the first group of books, I've, I've grouped these first books together, um, and, you know, where do we start with when we start with stories and reading? Well, a lot of us, we don't start with Brothers Karamazov, do we? We start with picture books. So there's a couple of staple ones, isn't there? I mean, I do remember us having The Very Hungry Caterpillar, a um, story about a caterpillar who I think eats a lot of junk food, or is it junk food or is it, yeah I think it is junk food, and then uh, he gets sick and then the next day he eats a bit of salad and then he turns into a beautiful butterfly. So there we go, there's that one. And um, the other staple one is, we can't go over it, we can't go under it, we have to go through it, and we do have to go through it. Yes, we're all going on a bear hunt. They go out for the express purpose of hunting a bear, and then they're surprised when the bear starts chasing them. Why are you no longer comfortable in the mess that you started, family? So yeah, there's a couple of staple ones. I mean, the other ones... Oh, well, first of all, I mean, Mr. Men and Little Misses. Now, I can't remember. I remember what's... I don't think that we had the box set. I've got the box set. <laughs> I do remember us having a few, and they didn't make, because on the side, if you do have the box set, then um, they they write out Mr. Men and Little Misses, don't they? Yeah, I remember us having a few, but they, they didn't quite <laughs> make the make the, the title. So um, I remember us having Mr. Bump, um, Mr. Jelly, or Mr. Messy, I can't remember. I think we had Mr. Tall. Yeah, there's a couple of ones that I do remember. I can't remember the stories at all. I can't remember the stories, but I, you know, you remember the characters, don't you? We did have, we had a VHS, we had a VHS of a cartoon of um, Little Misses, and I remember that, and I remember the theme tune being awesome. So there's that one. And then the other ones that I remember, which I'm not sure how um, much other people will remember this, maybe, maybe they do, but I remember having the Baby BB Bird. I remember Dad reading that aloud and that being very funny. Um, and then the other one, which I had to, I couldn't remember the title, I had to ask my family about this, but um, the Quangle Wangle's Hat. Um, I remember that because there were some pictures of some very strange animals in that, and I do remember those pictures. And yeah, when they reminded me of the title, I had a look, and I was just like, whoa, there's, there's my childhood. Um, so yes, so there we go, some picture books. So now on to number two. Is Roald Dahl a child hater? I think it was, it's, I know Enid Blyton was a child hater in real life. Uh, maybe Roald Dahl was as well. But yeah, I remember um, reading the twits and loving the twits. The thing about Roald Dahl is you can't really sort of mention Roald Dahl without also mentioning Quentin Blake, the illustrator. I mean, those drawings are so kind of ingrained with those stories, aren't they? Um, and I've gone back and I've had a look at some of the drawings of the twits and they're just glorious, aren't they? I love them so much. So yeah, the twits is about this really nasty, nasty uh, couple who are very ugly and very nasty and they... They like to um, trap birds and then on trees on glue and then stick them into pies. They have these monkeys which they train to stand upside down for hours on end. And then the monkeys and the birds kind of uh, collude together to get revenge. The other Roald Dahl ones I loved was, I did love the witches. And then the other one I remember having was not Charlie and the um, 
Chocolate Factory, but Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator, the sequel. Um, I remember having that when they go into space and meet these aliens called the Vinicius Canids. So yeah, they've they've really have stood the test of time with the uh, the appeal those books, haven't they? But uh, yeah, the Twits. Uh, I think they're making they're finally making it into a film or a series or something. I don't know whether it's going to be animated or whether it's going to be an actual thingy bob. But um, yes, that'll be interesting. So, number three. So, uh, a major, major children's book that I love is uh, The Phantom Tollbooth by Norton Juster. Illustrations by Jules Fafafafafafafa. Fa, 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 fa. Yes, yeah, so this is a very old copy. So The Phantom Tollbooth is um, a great little book about Milo. This kid called Milo who is very despondent and kind of very like, oh, I don't really know what to do. And one day in his bedroom there turns up a, a fold-up toll booth and a little car. And he uh, goes into the, into the little car and he goes past the toll booth and then he enters this magical world. I don't know whether it's sort of um, learning in disguise, but um, he goes to a city called Dictionopolis where they're all obsessed with words. Um, and they are, they've fallen out with this other, other city, Digitopolis, which is obsessed with numbers. And there's this whole thing, you have to go on this journey from Dictionopolis to Digitopolis, and uh, they go through all these magical lands. It's just great, I just really, really love it. And the other thing that I love is that the the writing itself is not... It's quite... It's quite complicated. Um, I would say it's quite complicated. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's just... It's really bonkers. <clears throat> it's really bonkers, and I just really, really love it. And I remember a couple of years ago... I reread it a couple of years ago, and I was just like, oh, the Phantom Tollbooth. So, yeah. Love it. I love it. I am, of all these books that I don't have anymore, these these are the ones which I wish I'd kept, because I just, I, ad I adored these books when I was, when I was a child. Um, and that is Dinotopia. So Dinotopia, I mean, the books themselves. So I had Dinotopia and The World Beneath. They are, from what I remember, they're these big kind of almost coffee table books. I mean, maybe they're not, maybe that's exaggerating, but big, big books. And they're a story, but they're made of, they've got these amazing paintings. And basically what it is, is this father and son, they get shipwrecked on an island or a, a continent, this sort of lost continent. And it's a continent where, or a big island where, um, Humans and dinosaurs are cohabit cohabi habiting, cohabit habiting, and it's just great, and I and I just really love it, and I think those drawings because I did have a major like many kids do, I had a major dinosaur phase, and those drawings are so great and so amazing, I, I really really love them, um, and the story of the world beneath, from what I remember, is fabulous as well, and I'm really surprised. I mean, I know that they've in the nine or the early noughties or the nineties, they did adapt it for a TV series, which apparently is very goofy and cheesy. Um, so we can forget that. But I'm surprised it hasn't been kind of opt optioned and not, you know, chosen to have a thing. I mean, maybe it will. Maybe it will in, in the wake of Jurassic World. Uh, maybe it will be uh, optioned again and have a new ad adaptation. So yeah, it's just one of those things which sort of sparked the imagination and it's had a map. I do love a book with a map, you know. Maybe if I can find... I'll see what how much they are um, secondhand and maybe I'll get get them again. Because I'd, I'd love to revisit them and see kind of whether they're any good or not. But I have had another Google image search of the paintings and yeah, it was sort of like, wow, yeah, those are amazing paintings. So yeah, Dinotopia. I, I loved it so much. Okay, number five, I do have some of these. Ugh. So the Horrible Histories books, books basically looking at history and looking at the nasty bits of history, you know. Um, and I collected them. Uh, I had a fair few and I've had a look and I've... I do have a couple and it's interesting kind of the ones which I've which have been saved from wherever the rest of them are. So I've got Vicious Vikings here. So yeah, it's basically history books, but just with cartoons and little bits and pieces in them. It just, yeah, I really love them. So I've got um, the Vicious Vikings, the Cutthroat Celts, Wicked Words, 
And then I have uh, this, the Angry Aztecs, and this is uh, signed. <laughs> this is signed. Ooh. So, uh, yeah, and there's a couple of bits and pieces here. I will not show you my room just now because I have some things from childhood. I have like a few things which I've sort of stuffed away from childhood. And I was really gutted because I thought I'd lost this and so I've sort of strewn every. <laughs> it looks like a crime scene here. But uh, no, I do have it, so that's good. So yeah, I loved it so much that I think my sister um, wrote to him and sort of got him to sign a book. So I was like, oh, so that's very nice. Eleventh uh, birthday. Oh, hello. That's nice. Sorry. Um, I haven't, oh, yeah, because I haven't looked at this for years and years and years. So there we go. So I've got a signed copy there, so that's nice. But I do remember having more. I had the one about Victorians. I had uh, the Saxons, the Tudors. Um, yeah, I had I had a few. I don't know where the rest of them have gone. Um, but uh, yeah, it's interesting, kind of the ones that I've that I've been saved. <laughs> Um, including this. I'm really glad I haven't lost this. Okay, number six. I don't have this. So this is an interesting one. I don't remember much about the story of this book, but I do remember having... having uh, I do remember it having a big sort of like, ooh. Because it was... Um, so, number, <laughs> number six is The Silver Sword by Ian Sorello. It's an interesting one, because I read this at the end of primary school, I remember, and I... It was just a book, it, it's a serious book, it's based on a true story, it's it's set in World War II, um, set in Poland, and it's this true story of these, I think, three children who had to sort of fend for themselves for a good long time. Um, I don't know where their father or mother were, I can't remember now, but um, they had to fend for themselves uh, in Poland, and they made friends with this kind of other feral uh, kid, this young boy. But yeah, I remember reading it, and because it was, it had a more sort of serious tone, um, I don't know, I mean it mustn't have been like the first kind of like serious book that I read, but I do, something about it has, has stayed with me, um, for me to kind of go, oh yeah, The Silver Sword. So I do, I do remember really liking it and really sort of being really sort of invested in it. Um, and so, yes, that'll be an interesting one to reread and sort of just to see what that's all about and why, and why it stayed with me. Um, I think, I think it must be because it was kind of like a serious book and a serious story and whether or not it was the first kind of like, you know, serious fiction book, even though it's based on a true story, but a serious fiction book that kind of really sort of stayed with me, I don't know. Particularly as I went into secondary school. Because I do, because you know, nowadays I do love a good dirgy literary fiction book. Um, so it'll be interesting to reread that and see why it's sort of stuck with me in my brain. Uh, number seven. Seven! Yes, The Hobbit. The Hobbit. The Hobbit. So I can't say that I'm a big Tolkien fan now. Um, I did read The Hobbit, this is before, in primary school, this is before the, the Lord of the Rings films came out, and The Hobbit, I mean, I did, I did love it a lot, I really, really loved The Hobbit a lot, I just loved it, obviously I loved the story, and I loved the, the world, and, and everything like that, so the films came out, and I was, I'm a, I was the perfect age when the films came out, I mean, I think I was, I was like 13 or something when the film, the first film came out, and... Yeah, I mean, it just, I mean, that that's something that really captured the imagination, didn't it? I remember trying to read Lord of the Rings, or I remember trying to read Fellowship of the Ring, and I didn't really get very far at that point because, in my life, because from what I remember, particularly in the first part of it, they'll have an adventure or something exciting will happen, and then they'll sit down and have uh, dinner or lunch for like 10 pages, and there'll be really sort of descriptive things about what they're having for dinner. That might not, that's what I remember. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that's why I'd never, I never sort of carried on with reading The Fellowship of the Ring or the rest of them. And oh gosh, I really should, shouldn't I? I really, really should. Um, but yeah, but The Hobbit, I definitely, I definitely did read The Hobbit. And that was a book that I really loved. And I really loved that edition as well. Yeah. And I, yeah, maybe I do need to attempt Lord of the Rings again. I think I will do that at some point. Maybe not this year, maybe next year, but yes. Uh, number eight. 
Oh my goodness gracious. So, I loved the Goosebump books so much. The Goosebump books. Ugh. I loved them. I, <laughs> I really, really loved them. It's kind of a shame because I don't have any of them anymore, but I had a good 50 of them. I'm pretty sure. I've had a look and I'm pretty sure that I had nearly, if not, the first 50. And I just loved them. I, lo I really loved them. So the Goosebump books um, are, of course, these kind of teen, middle grade or teen uh, horror books. And I had the the copy where the copies where it was all bubbles and something was coming out of the bubbles like uh, and someone told me that actually those copies are out of print now and they're actually quite valuable so that's annoying yeah I I really loved them and it's interesting because I'm not really a horror person but at that point and in time <laughs> I I just loved I loved those stories and I loved that I loved collecting them I think that was the main thing and I loved them so much that my parents would use them as bargaining chips for me. You know, they, I mean, the major one they said was, if you do your cycle proficiency test, then uh, we'll get you four Goosebump books. And I was like, four Goosebump books. So I was like, you know, immediately on that bike and sort of like, ah! I'm sure you've seen it, but um, Gavin from How to Train Your Gavin did a three hour um, massive thing of looking at all, revisiting all the Goosebump books. Um, and I did watch... I didn't watch all of it, but I watched a, a lot of it, and it was just like, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh. Uh. So yeah, watch that video, because that's amazing. So there we go. Okay, number nine. So I was umming and ahhing whether to include this series, because they're not books that I was really obsessed over, the same way that I was obsessed with Goosebumps or, you know, Horrible Histories or whatever. But one cannot do a video like this and be my age and not mention these books because I am Generation Harry Potter. <laughs> so I was 10 when the first book Philosopher's Stone came out and I do remember, I do remember the the hype, the hype, and I remember the just the, the frenzy of it and how everyone was talking about it and you know uh, parents were buying it for their kids and the kids were loving it and then the parents would read it and they'd be like, oh, this is good. And it just sort of grew and grew and grew from that. Um, and I, because I was 10 when the first book came out, I mean, for the first sort of three or four, we were basically the same age as, as Harry. As he was growing up, we were growing up as well. And so there was something, there was something about that as well, kind of, you know, every year getting the new Harry Potter book and what, what are they all doing and everything. Um, and I remember really liking the first three. Um, I really liked the first three. Then by the time the fourth one came out, um, I'd sort of lost interest a bit. Or I read the fourth one and I wasn't so kind of like, uh, okay. Because that's where I stopped. I stopped after the fourth, the fourth one. Um, I think because Goblet of Fire, that's, I mean, that kind of, it sort of jumped up in, in length, didn't it? It was suddenly this massive brick. Um, and I was kind of not so, maybe because by the time I was sort of in my mid-teens, I was sort of more interested interested in other things. But um, but yeah, so I read the fourth one. And then when the fifth one came out, I mean, the fifth one was like absolutely enormous, wasn't it? And I was just like, oh, I can't be bothered. <laughs> um, I've never watched a film. I've never watched, well, I've never watched a film from start to finish. And uh, and yeah, I've never read five, six or seven. So yeah, that was why I was sort of umming and ahhing about whether to include it. But you just can't deny the influence that it had on... Not only my generation, but succeeding generations. Um, getting everyone was reading it. Everyone was reading it, and uh, and yeah, it was just one of those one of those sort of phenomenon. And I did like the first three. I mean, I remember really liking the, the third one, Prisoner of Azkaban. That had a really interesting story. Um, I <laughs> there's a video. I think he's just called Sean. He does like a really long. I think it's like an hour and a half might even be two hours or something, long video, kind of just going through Harry Potter and dissecting all the kind of the weird, the politics of it and the weird things of it. Um, not what you might think, but just like the, yeah, just some of the the, the dodgy stuff about Harry Potter. Um, you know, yeah, which, is, which I did find interesting. It's fascinating having lived at that time. And I mean, I do remember like by the end, by the seventh one, or sixth, seventh. Um, I mean, there were mile-long queues. There were queues and queues and queues, like, overnight, 
to get you know a copy um and sort of living through that that's kind of interesting isn't it and now it is you know embedded in the cement work of children's literature now um so that's sort of interesting as well and yeah i have no sort of real desire to sort of go back and revisit them really i can't really imagine why i would um uh other than sort of <laughs> other than sort of see what happens in five six and seven but they are long and at this point in my life i'm reading <laughs> i'm reading very very long books and you know that's sort of what I'm devoting my time to. So, uh, yeah, but Harry Potter, there we go. So, number 10. Um, so, yes, yeah, so by the mid, so by mid teens, uh, I wasn't so interested in Harry Potter, but I was interested in His Dark Materials. His Dark Materials uh, by Philip Pullman. Um, so, I did revisit these books, I think last year, and did a video on it. Um, I mean, these ones, I mean, I really, really loved these ones, and particularly Northern Lights. I mean, that, that book is kind of just, it's so weird. It's so, it's such a strange, um, specific uh, plot and magic system and world and everything. But the way he does it, the way he kind of um, world builds and the way he kind of unravels the story, it's just really, I I really, really love it a lot. And the the uh, Svalbard and all the rest of it. I mean, I love that. Um, the other two, I mean, uh, the subtle, sub subtle knife. Um, that's again, that's sort of interesting. But um, Amber Spyglass. You read Amber Spyglass for the story rather than the writing, because because I did feel like the writing quality did sort of decrease book by book. So that's a shame. But um, the story itself in the Amber Spyglass is sort of like immense. You know. So yeah, the story about Lyra and her D dame and demon, um, and this sort of battle between God, God, this sort of uh, metaphorical thing about you know transitioning into adulthood, um, you know, it's just yeah, it's really really fascinating. It's interesting how they've tried um, a few times to adapt these books, and. I mean, The Golden Compass with Daniel Craig and Nicole Kidman, I mean, I did remember watching that and that was, yeah, they kind of, they didn't do very well with that. I didn't, I haven't seen the TV series. Um, I think the TV series is meant to be good. I think. Is it meant to be good? I think it is meant to be good. Um, there's also, there was also a play adaptation, I think, as well. So yeah, as I say, I mean, the, as, a, as the books go on, the writing quality does sort of drop. Um, particularly Amber Spyglass with some really sort of like rushed moments in there but the story and the characters um and the kind of just the whole the world and the kind of the magic system and everything i really i really love i really love it and rereading it again was interesting because of the underlying themes of transitioning from childhood to adult adulthood um it was interesting to kind of revisit that again and this whole thing about religion um and uh, sort of killing god to us for to a certain extent. Um, so that was interesting to sort of revisit as an adult and sort of see what Pullman was saying. So yes, so these were a, a big major 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 influence and um, and yeah, I love, I love these a lot. So there we go, so that's um, 10 groups of books which I, I remember and look on with fondness or had a major influence on me. Um, and what have we learned from that? Well, <laughs> it says that uh, I used to be very much into fantasy, which I'm not really anymore. I, haven't, I don't really read very much fantasy anymore, um, which is interesting. Or if I do read fantasy, it's kind of magic realism, <laughs> dirgy literary fiction, magic realism. Uh, I mean, this is, this is not dirgy, but this is what I'm reading at the moment. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, the books that I'm reading at the moment I've got Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie and uh, the fifth volume of Proust. So that's sort of interesting that we've kind of gone from there to here. That might be interesting, mightn't it, sort of go through more my teenage, young adult um, life and see what kind of books I was interested in then, because it did shift. I did, I did have a shift um, in what I was interested in. 
So I might do that video as well, because now I'm interested in that. I mean, apart from, you know, the very, very earlier ones, I mean, Dinotopia, Harry Potter, Goosebumps, Hobbit, Dark Materials, I mean, they're all fantasy stuff. I mean, the only ones that are not fantasy is The Silver Sword, and The Silver Sword, I mean, Horrible Histories is, is um, um, non-fiction, and then you go right back to The Twits. So that's interesting that I've not carried that on, not carried on uh, fantasy books. But yeah, I would, I really do want to read Lord of the Rings. I do need to read Lord of the Rings. So there we go. So I hope everyone is alright, and uh, yes, thank you for watching if you've been watching, and I shall see you very soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>